1 Corinthians chapter 14, I saw two main divisions in there. We looked at the first one already, which was pursue love. When we're talking about gifts, gifts of the Spirit, pursue love. Those, those gifts of the Spirit are meant to be used to bless everybody. And if I'm just using those gifts of the Spirit in church to glorify myself, that's not very loving. I want to pursue love. Everything that I do, I want to pursue love. We, as Christians, we should be the ones out of everybody else in the world who are pursuing love the most. And the second thing, that a second main division, which we'll see tonight, this is what we're going to be in, practical instructions for church order. Uh, that will uh, take us from verse 26 down to verse 40. So now Paul, he's been talking about the gifts of the Spirit, which has been kind of myster mysterious to us. What does it mean and what is all of that? And, and to be honest with you, we never really got a clear description of like what the gift of tongues is like. Or uh, he's, I think we, we, it, he's been a little bit clearer on the gift of, of prophecy or prophesying. Um, but we've seen through these chapters that Paul's main goal here is, is not just to teach you about the gifts, but really more so how to use them and why you have them and, and what the main goal of all that is. And so now what he's doing is he's telling us, he's kind of bringing that section to a close and he's telling us as far as gifts uh, of the spirit and church services, everything needs to be done decent and in order. And now he's going to give us some very practical instructions. And so it says in verse 26, it says this, how is it then, brethren, or brothers, or a church family, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm okay, that you want to share with people, has a teaching that you want to share with people in the church, has a tongue, that's the gift of tongues that you want to share with people, has a revelation that you want to share with people, has an interpretation. And then he says this, let all things be done for edification. What is the main point of having the gifts of the Spirit? The main point is to edify. Edify, what does that mean? If you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, edify reminds us of an edifice, like a building. And the idea is to build one another up. That's the main goal of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, so that if I have the gift of teaching, I need to be using that not as a money maker, man, and let me go travel and you know be the the you know some you know some kind of uh, uh, you know speaker that travels around the world. But I need to use that gift to build up the body, to build up the uh, the, the the church body. That's what it's for. And whatever gift you might have, that's what it's for. It's for blessing other people. Now, in verses 27 and 28, what he does is he tells us about tongues, gives us some practical instructions concerning the gift of tongues. If anyone speaks in a tongue, now remember he's speaking about the church setting. So just what you're sitting in right now, the public church setting, that's what you're in right now. If, okay, and he's already established that in the previous studies, if anyone speaks in a tongue in this setting, he says, let there be two or at the most three each in turn, and let one interpret. Now, I shared with you my story a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week, about being in a church service many years ago, and everybody in the church stood up and started speaking in tongues. That was in direct, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, direct uh, 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 contradiction to what he says here. He says, if you're in the public church setting and someone starts to speak in tongues, they've got the gift of tongues, he says, let there be two, at the most three, and then let each one take a turn, and then there needs to be an interpreter. And then he goes on to say this in verse 28, but if there is no interpreter, if there's no one there with the gift of interpretation, then let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. So, we get some practical instruction. If someone's got the gift of tongues, and they're starting to use it in the church service, in order to keep things orderly in order to keep things as he as he'll say at the end decent and in order there needs to be two people three at the most he says and then regardless of how many there are there needs to be someone interpreting and if there's no one that stands up and says okay uh, I have the gift of interpretation, and this individual was speaking in tongues, but this is what they were saying. If no one does that, then his instructions are in verse 28, 28 to the, those people that were speaking in tongues, they need to just sit down and just be quiet. 
Don't, it's, it's, not, it's not glorifying to anyone. It's not edifying. It's not building anyone up if you're saying something that no one understands. So when you come to church, you should understand what's being said, okay? Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, I never understand what you say, P Pastor Chris, so I, I, maybe I should leave. But I, hopefully you get the point that if I'm speaking in some kind of different language and you guys don't understand me, that's not holy or super spiritual. Uh, it's just foolish because we come here to learn things, okay? Now, verses 29 through 30, uh, 33, rather, he tells us, uh, talks to us about taking turns. And he, what he does now is he turns to the gift of prophesying. And he says in verse 29, real practical, let two or three prophets speak. So if there are a few people in the church that have the gift of prophecy, he says, and, and they're going to use it in service, he says it needs to just be two or three. So not a whole bunch. There's not like, okay, all the prophets line up on this side, you know, and everybody's going to get a turn. He says, look, it needs to be decent in order. So let it just be two or three people and let the others judge. They need to judge. Is this really from God? What this person is saying, they're prophesying, this word from God, is it really from God? So in the first instance with tongues, there needed to be an interpreter. If not, sit down and be quiet. Now he says for the prophets, you're going to let, every, the, you're going to let the others judge what's being said. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. Okay? So again, we've got some practical rules there. It needs to just be two or three at the most. And uh, the, it, what, what they're saying needs to be judged by the others to make sure that it really is. Yeah, this is, this is biblical. Somebody can't just stand up and, you know, say something in church and then everybody just accepts it as gospel. We've, we've got to be listening and say, wait, wait, you know, what did you say? Okay, wait, that doesn't line up with scripture or, yeah, I, that, that does line up with the Bible. He goes on to say in verse 31, for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. That's why we're here, to learn, to be encouraged. Verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, meaning that, that some guy or some lady can't just stand up in church and say, I've got a word from the Lord, and they just start spilling it out, da, 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 and they go on for 45 minutes, and they just say, well, sorry, I didn't have any control. God just took over me. Paul says, no, that doesn't happen. The prophets are able to start and they're able to stop. They've got a message from God, but they doesn't mean that they just lose control and, oh, they just, you know, I just kind of vomited all over everybody, you know, what I had to say and, and uh, you know, forget what the pastor was saying because I, I had something. Um, he says, no, they, they, they have control. So if somebody shows up and they, well, I didn't have any control. Sorry, brother. I was just, con I was just filled with the spirit. I, there's nothing I could do about it. Paul is saying, no, that's not how it works. In verse 33, he says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So, see, God, the, the church, when we have a church service, it needs to be orderly. It's going to be orderly. If God is in it, if God is really controlling this, then what he says is that it's not going to be confusing where, oh, man, what's going on over here? Again, I shared with you my, my couple of stories, my couple of experiences, like right after I got saved. And the second church I went to, church hadn't even started. I just got in there early. I'm sitting down, and everybody was just doing their own thing. People speaking in tongues all over the place. And some guy, you know, there was like a, a guy uh, praying, but almost yelling at us over the speaker. And it was like, what's going on? And people standing up, sitting down, kneeling down there. And it's just and people walking around, talking. I mean, it was just, it was a madhouse, really. And, and the service hadn't even started yet. And uh, so what Paul is saying is, listen, if, if God is in it, it's not going to be all confusing. And man, uh, you know, it's not going to look like a, like a three ring circus with, you know, a dancing bear over here and clowns over here and a lion jumping through a fire ring. And man, where do I look? It's, gonna, it's going to all be orderly and, and uh, uh, decent and, and in order. Now, in verses 34 through, uh, verses 34 and 35, I love these verses. Talking in church. Verse 34. Let your women keep silent in the churches. And all the men said, Amen. <laughs> Don't say Amen. Because you're about to get 
Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. I feel like that really doesn't need any explanation. Girls, be quiet. Let's just move on. This, this gives me, let me, let me share something with you. Um, of all the things that I teach you in here, um, this gives me a great opportunity to teach you something that is extremely important. If you haven't been listening, I know sometimes people come just for the social thing and it's kind of like, I don't know what's going on in the Bible study. I was here to hang out. But if you haven't been listening, would you listen for the next few minutes? Just a few minutes. And then when I'm done with, with verses uh, 34 and 35, you can go back to spacing out if you want or whatever. Okay, <laughs> Thinking about that test that you didn't, or the math homework that you didn't do or something. Let, let me explain something to you. Um, context is of the utmost importance. When you are studying the Bible, context. Okay? What happens is oftentimes people will go to the Bible, I see this all the time, and they'll take out a verse that they like, or maybe don't like, they'll take that out, and they'll say, look, you know, this is what the Bible says. And they might use it for their own purposes to, uh, to advance themselves, or if it's a verse or a passage that they don't like, they'll take that out and then they'll show everybody and say, look, this is why the Bible's bad or this is why Christianity is bad. Now, I'm pointing that out. Again, just please, if you, if you haven't been paying attention, please pay attention for just a couple of minutes because this gives us an, an opportunity that, we, uh, that we, don't, we don't always get to spend you know, a few minutes on. Context. Feminists, okay? I'm not talking about you. If you consider yourself to be a feminist, I'm not talking about you. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that feminists for many, 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 many years have been coming to the Bible and discounting Paul, calling him a male chauvinist pig or a, uh, uh, you know, he hated women. And what they'll do is they will Get verses like this, verses 34 and 35. They will take that, they'll snatch that out of the Bible, and then they will, they will go talk to people. Uh, it might be a teacher that you have in school. It might be a professor later on in college that will pull this out and say, look, the Bible, uh, it, it, um, uh, it enslaves women, you know, uh, Paul's writings, you know, he was a male chauvinist, he was not really from God, and you need to discount it. What they do is they'll take these two verses right out of the chapter and say, look what it says. Now, if you and I were to just open up the Bible tonight and there was nothing else in the Bible, we were to open it up and we saw these two verses. Let your women keep silent in the churches. They're not permitted to speak. They're to be submissive, as the law says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it's shameful for women to speak in church. And if that's all we had, we would go, man, it's pretty harsh. It's pretty harsh. And this is why it is so important to keep verses when we're reading the Bible in context. Uh, grammatical context also, uh, obviously, but also historical context. What was going on in the Corinthian church at that time? Here we are in 2022. We have some idea about what was going on in, in Corinth, but the, the truth is that we don't know every single thing that was going on in Corinth, and I want you to keep something in mind. Let me, let me make my case for a moment. You didn't even notice this. You just let this slip by. Now, we're reading verses 34 and 35, and it says, listen, tell those women to be quiet, okay? Look at verse 28 again. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church. The person that's speaking in tongues. If there's no interpreter, they better just be quiet. It's funny, no one ever complains about that. No one ever says, oh, 
those poor people who speak in tongues, man, they're just so uh, uh, just uh, uh, oppressed in the church. Paul's telling them to be quiet. No one ever complains about that. You want another one that you just let slip by? Look at verse 30. Speaking about the prophets. But if anything is revealed to another one who sits by, let the first keep silent. Let him just be quiet. It's funny. No one ever complains. Oh, those poor prophets, man. They're not even allowed to speak in church. No one ever complains about that. What they'll do is they'll pick out verses 34 and 35, and they'll say, look at this. Women are so oppressed, and this is terrible, and Christianity is, is just harming women. So it's important that we keep it in its context. I'll explain that in just a moment, but don't turn there. I'll just tell you because we don't have that much time, but you can write it down and look it up if you want. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, Paul said this. Paul said, but every woman who prays or prophesies. So Paul, in chapter 11, a few chapters back, said that in the church setting, there are, there are women there who can pray or prophesy in the, church, in the public church setting. So which is it, Paul? Can they pray or prophesy in the church, or do they have to be quiet? Which is it? <clears throat> it's both. What? How can it be both? I'll explain to you in just a moment, but let me continue to make my case, please. Again, you don't have to turn there. You can write this down if you want or get it from me later. But in Matthew chapter 27, verse 55, we're told there, and many women who follow Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar. From the beginning, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, there were women there who were extremely important to the ministry of Jesus. I'm making my case that women have an extremely important role in the church. And that what we read in verses 34 and 35 is not meant to tell the women, you better just be quiet and don't you ever speak again in church. That's not what it's meant, but I'm not done making my case. In Acts chapter 1, when the church was just getting started, this brand new thing called the church, in Acts chapter 1 verse 14, it says this, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. At the founding of the church, there was an important place there for the women that were there. They were a part of it. And they were praying, and there was supplication going on, and the women were a part of that. Let me make my case just one more time, and then we'll go back to these verses. And I'll explain to you what I believe is happening in Corinth. Acts chapter 16, as Paul goes into Philippi, the, the, the letter to the Philippians... Do you know who the first convert in Philippi, the very first Christian in Philippi? Anybody know who it was? Anybody know it starts with an L, ends with an idia? <laughs> Lydia. Lydia. Paul preached, and the first person to believe in Jesus Christ was Lydia. She was the start of the church there in Philippi. I, I bring these up, and there are other places that we can go, but I bring these up because I need you to understand that women have an extremely important role in the church. They've always had an extremely important role in God's plan, and they always will. I'm making my case again because it has happened. It's happened, it's happened, to, to, it's happened to people that I know, to young ladies that I know, that someone said, look, Paul's a chauvinist, and Christianity is bad for you, and it suppresses women. Let me show you 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. And then they go there and they read that. Let the women keep silent. They're not allowed to talk. Oh, man, this, you're right. You're right. What is going on in verses 34 and 35? Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. They're dismissive. Let me ask you a question. Let's see if you've been paying attention. What's the overall picture that Paul is talking about in these chapters? What's the big picture? Does anybody know what it is? What is it? Edification. Edification. That's the building up, right? And he's talking about that in the setting of what? Is he talking about uh, 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 this group of Christians that's at the mall? Is he what's he talking about? The church. the church. In the public church setting. And he's talking about keeping things in order. Shouldn't be all wild. Shouldn't be all chaotic. Now, we slow down, we read a little bit, verse 34. 
that your women keep silent in the churches. But Paul said they could pray and prophesy. He did. So does he mean they can't talk at all? Well, obviously he doesn't mean that because he's already said they can pray and prophesy. So what does he mean? Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. They are to be submissive, as the law also says. Verse 35, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home is the key. At the beginning of verse 35. If they want to learn something, it is believed, okay? Uh, uh, better Bible teachers than I have studied this. It is believed that in the Corinthian church, okay, um, historical context, remember I talked about historical context, what was going on at that time, not what's going on in First Californians right now, what was going on in First Corinthians back then, what was happening? Well, it is believed that in the church, in the, in the Christian church, that the ladies would sit on one side and that the guys would sit on the other side. That was just how they normally did it. We don't do that anymore. Some of the ladies might wish we did. Like, yeah, let's just have these guys way on the other side, you know, until they get some Axe body spray. But, <laughs> but, but, but it is believed that they were separated. And it is believed that what was happening, now listen to the group of women that he's talking to. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. Which group of ladies was he, was he talking to all the ladies? What, what group does he seem to kind of focus on? Married. The married ladies, right? So it is believed that in church, the ladies who were not used to being in church, man, this is, they, they, were, they were from California, or uh, Corinth. They were kind of wild. Whatever, whatever was going on. It is believed that in the middle of the pastor teaching, middle of the sermon, that they'd be like, cross the room to their husband. Hey, Chris, what is he talking about? <laughs> and then the pastor was like, well, yeah, yeah. And so it is believed that Paul is saying, listen, in the church service, we've got to keep everything in order. And listen, ladies, you can't be yelling out across the room to your husband. Just be quiet. And he says, listen, if, there's, if you've got a question, just wait till you get home and talk to your husband. Now, again, some, some may not even like that. Well, why should you wait till she gets home? And there goes the hip and it's all, it's, the head's all loose and it's over. But here's the deal. Listen, let me, let me explain something to you. The ladies, they're, they're being instructed here, listen, if you've got a husband, you just hold on. Don't yell across the room. Just wait till you get home. Ask your husband. So you might say, well, man, she can't even talk, and she's got to wait till she gets home or whatever. But think about this. Think about those poor husbands. Look, let me share something with you, okay? Bible study going on. My wife has a, a, a question. There's a good chance I don't know what the answer is. And if we wait till we get home, the pressure's on, man. I would rather actually just, why don't you just ask me at church right now, and then I can go up and ask the pastor real sly-like, and you know, come back real cool like I got the answer, you know? But there is the instruction, no, just hold, don't be yelling across the room, wait till you get home, ask your husband. But then the pressure's on for the husband, because now the husband's got to have the answer. So where the ladies, and maybe at a certain time, hey, just be quiet, hold on. Well, when they get home, the man better not be quiet. He better be speaking up and teaching his wife, loving his wife, instructing his wife. Now, I have a question. This is a question that I cannot answer. I'm just throwing it out there because this is the kind of thing that goes on in my puny, weird little brain. It says there in verse 35, let them ask their own husbands at home. What if they're not married? Then who are they supposed to ask? Well, they probably, if they're not married, they probably wouldn't be yelling out at their husbands across the room. And so maybe they would come up afterwards and say, hey, uh, I had this question, you know, what, what, what do you think? This does not seem to be a problem throughout the New Testament churches. Now, maybe it's because in the other churches, the lady, maybe they weren't from Corinth, you know what I mean? And they, you know, uh, I mean, you have in Corinth, you've got, uh, we already know this, you've got slaves as part of the church. Uh, you've got probably, you probably have women that used to be prostitutes. They got saved, now they're in the church. So they're just not used, they, they're not like you, where you grew up in church, you know that you better be quiet or you're going to get your dad's hand across the back of your head or whatever. You know, you just got to be quiet. 
They don't know that. And so maybe, maybe they're just kind of yelling out, hey, this is what you do. You just yell out and get the answer. But what happens is when we take those verses out of context, we rip them out, we can make them say, here's the danger. When we take verses out of the Bible, then we can make them say whatever we want them to say. So when you're reading the Bible, studying the Bible, context. Now listen, I've told you this before. Some of you haven't heard this. I know that this youth group, I, I know, I know for a fact that there are funner youth groups that you could be a part of. You could be spending your Wednesday night at a youth group where they play games and they have all kinds of fun and they do all kinds of things. To each his own, if that's what you want to do. My problem with, and then it's like you come here, worship, Bible study, worship, Bible study. And that is because one of these days, your friend or your best friend is going to text you or call you and say, you know what, I'm so depressed. My parents are splitting up. I just feel like killing myself. And a game is not going to help you. What's going to help you? God's word. So that's why we go there. That's why, man, even on events we get Bible studies, man. We go to camp. Why do we have to have so many Bible studies at camp? Think I haven't heard it? Been hearing it for years. Because it is life-saving because that is what is best for all of us. I like games. I've told you this before. I'm not a fun guy, but I like games. It's not like I dislike games, but I want you to understand the Bible because that's what you need. When you get to college in a couple of years and some professor says to you, the Bible's not real and God's not real and I've got proof. Listen, is a game of musical chairs going to help you? But you being able to go, wait a minute, i got to go back to the Bible. Let me look for it here. Let me find out, okay, yeah, that's right. I think I remember something, one of the, you know, Pastor Chris's dumb studies or something about that. And let me look at it. And, and then you can go back to the Bible. So what he's saying here, I believe, is he's telling them, not just these ladies, but I, I, I mean, generally speaking, hey, don't be talking in church. And it's okay back and forth a little bit. Hey, you know, you say something back and forth. Here, in this setting, you're, you're allowed to talk a little bit back and forth, but obviously when it becomes distracting, then the leaders are going to say, hey, you know, be quiet or whatever. But I believe that that's what's going on. Okay? Now, he goes on in verses 36 through 38. He shows us a test. And I've got to hurry through this because we've got to get you out of here to small groups. A test. He's testing. Verse 36. He asked this question, or did the word of God come originally from you or was it you only that it reached no the answer is the word of god came from god through paul to the corinthians you can go back to the book of acts and read about how that happened he says in verse 37 he gives us a little test a little rule here if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual so this person comes to the church, and they say, hey, I'm a prophet, okay? Or they say, I'm spiritual, I'm a, I'm a spiritual leader. He says this in verse 37, here's the test. Let that person acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Paul, what he says is, if they come to you and they're, they're, they've got, they're saying, hey, I've got this special gift and I'm this holy uh, man or woman of God, he says the test is let him acknowledge that Paul's writings are the commandments of the Lord, that God was speaking through Paul. But if anyone, my translation says, but if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. What it means is if anyone does not recognize Paul's writings as being from God, then let that person not be recognized. If they do not accept that Paul's writings are from God, then they are to be rejected. I've, I've got a, actually one of my former students. He's a dear friend, former student, but um, a while back he um, uh, announced that he was a, uh, a Christian anarchist. 
Um, <laughs> I, I'll be honest, I'm not very smart. I don't know what that means. Like, what do you, I don't even say. And he went on to explain that they, that his, I don't know, well, anyways, he said he, he no longer accepts Paul's writings as the word of God. That he only follows the, 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 uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, doesn't, doesn't listen, he doesn't uh, 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 accept Paul's writings, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, 1 Corinthians, all these, he doesn't accept that. What does it say here? That if the individual does not accept Paul's writings as being from God, then that person is to be rejected. So it's a test. It's a test. It's not the only test, but it is a good test. If someone goes, and you'll, you'll come across it at some point, someone will say, oh, Paul wasn't really from God. Well, then, then it's a little bit of a test. It's an indication to you that, you know what, I don't need to spend a lot of time listening to you because you, you obviously don't, you don't believe the word of God. Now let's finish. Verses 39 and 40. Therefore, brethren, or brothers, or family, guys and girls, I believe, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. And here it is in verse 40, to end it all, let all things be done decently and in order. Bam! 